This is Taiwan Insider, a weekly roundup of news brought to you by Radio Taiwan International. Every week, we give you an inside look at the biggest and most interesting stories coming out of Taiwan. I am Natalie So, and I'm Andrew Ryan, and here's your week in a minute. Microsoft sues Taiwanese electronics giant Foxconn over licensing disputes, but Chairman Terry Goh says his company is a scapegoat in the U.S.-China trade war, and that Microsoft is afraid to go after Chinese companies. Pandas spark a debate after a Chinese official says Beijing could give Kaohsiung a pair as a gift. Some question the cost, others the politics of it. It's unclear how serious the suggestion might be. President Tsai is set to arrive in Taiwan's Pacific Allies later this month. She will visit Palau, Nauru, and the Marshall Islands. Taiwan's police agency is looking to change public order laws, but rights groups say this could harm freedom of assembly. Taoyuan Airport is struggling with maintenance issues. First a blackout, then a pothole in a runway that delayed at least 121 flights. Students are leaving Taiwan in droves for an education abroad, sparking anxiety over the future of Taiwanese schools. The government is earmarking 1.3 billion NT dollars to keep gifted students in Taiwan. And that's your Week in a Minute. Every week at the top of our show, we come up with a word of the week that we think describes how we're feeling about the week. So, Andrew, mm. can you guess what I'm thinking here? Andrew. Not Andrew! <laughs> Don't be such a narcissist. <laughs> Anxiety. Anxiety. Oof. Okay, so this has to do with some of the stories that we'll be talking about today. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to be doing a long story about defense. Of course, there's anxiety, even though um, the military is confident. <laughs> I don't know. I, I feel anxiety when I think about war. And <laughs> um, also, we will be talking about how much it costs to raise a family. I know a lot of people have anxiety over raising children, the cost of it. Mm. And we also have a story about myopia, the growth of that in children, nearsightedness. And I think that comes from academic anxiety. People are spending too much time on their books. Yes. Not enough time outdoors. It, so anxious parents, <laughs> anxious children. <laughs> you know, I feel like I've been dealing with like low level anxiety for two years now. <laughs> <laughs> so here's my word of the week. Can you guess what it is? Ta -da. Dumb? No. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> Deafening? No. Defense! <laughs> Defense. Ah. That's right. So I went right there because that is one of the stories that we'll be talking about. But actually there are two ways you can say this. You can say defense. Like as in offense and defense. Uh -huh. When you're in sports or something. That's right. And also politicians are on, on well, on the defense, would you say they that? Are or on often, the defense? Often on the defense. Yes, yeah. on the defense. That's right. So defending policies, uh, defending decisions. And of course, as we're going to find out in today's top story, defending Taiwan. All right. So let me take these words Alrighty. and put them on our shelf. So anxiety, defense, was that what we're going to call it? <laughs> or defense, anxiety. Yes. We've got two... Uh, Anxiety, defense. Kind of uh, anxious words up there today. And they're All going to right. be watching kind, over kind us for of, the whole show. Yes, really. That's the mood. <laughs> so um, anyways, our top story is about defense. We've been covering a lot of stories about Taiwan's security and also its ability to defend itself. Now, one of the stories that we covered was that in May, the Hanguang Annual Military Exercises is going to feature jet fighters landing on the nation's highways. And we have a clip of that. And uh, in this clip, we can see that uh, different types of military hardware on roads that are normally reserved for cars. Mm. And we can actually um, see that these highways, it's interesting that they were built in a way that they can be used as a runway in an emergency. Mm -hmm. Also, one thing that's interesting is that uh, Taiwan has asked the United States to sell it 66 F-16V jet fighters, and those will have a price tag of 13 billion U.S. dollars. That's we, a lot of money. Right. We found that out last week. So and this is a, an ongoing kind of theme that we're discussing here in Taiwan is how does Taiwan defend itself? Yes, and recently the military also released footage of Mirage fighters, so we can take a look at that. Wow, look at that. And the military says that in the event of an emergency, they can take off and scramble in six minutes to defend the nation. Wow. 
Now, of course, the reason why defense uh, is such an important topic here in Taiwan is because China considers Taiwan part of its territory and has not renounced the use of force to take Taiwan back. Uh, and also, the two sides have been governed separately since 1949. The People's Republic of China administering mainland China and the Republic of China here in Taiwan. Now, the question is, how exactly does Taiwan defend itself? And is it prepared? And that is the topic of today's Taiwan Explained. All right, so in today's Taiwan Explained, I am going to be talking about national defense. And you have 60 seconds. Are you ready, Andrew? Oh, that's a that's big a topic. That's a lot to talk about in 60 seconds. <laughs> ready, go. I think go. I can do it. All right. So let's talk, start with some numbers. As of 2018, Taiwan has an all-volunteer military force of about 188,000 people. By comparison, China has the largest military in the world with 2 million active wow. personnel. Also, budgets for this year. Taiwan is outnumbered. Uh, the budget was just under 11 billion U.S. dollars uh, compared to a 7.6 percent rise for China's military budget for 2019 to 177.6 billion U.S. dollars. As for weaponry, F-16s, Taiwan buys most of its hardware from the United States, which is required to sell Taiwan weapons of defense, required by law, that is. Um, they also sell Taiwan uh, things like Patriot missiles, anti-submarine aircraft. Now, the U.S. is... Uh, as I mentioned, the biggest provider of weapons to Taiwan, but Taiwan also has indigenous weapons like this IDF fighter you see here and has increased the budget to uh, create more of those weapons. So could Taiwan withstand an attack from China? And I'm running out of time. <laughs> ah, you went over time. Oh, you didn't go over time. You want to stop now? Um, yeah, yeah well, uh, let me, let me, let me, let <laughs> me go over time. That's a good time. question. That's a good question. <laughs> that's the main question. And actually. I can answer my own question with this final slide here. If you look at the top countries in the world in terms of military spending. China is second from the top of the list. Uh, Taiwan is not on the list. Um, however, the anxiety comes in. I know. <laughs> I feel bad now because our show is actually creating anxiety <laughs> to people that are <laughs> watching it. To but to feel a little bit better, I should mention that Taiwan's defense minister says that Taiwan is prepared to defend itself. And uh, should a war break out, he says the military would fight until the end. Okay, so Taiwan says they are able to defend itself. Mm -hmm. um, when was the last time that Taiwan and China did engage militarily? That's a great question. Uh, the last time that the two sides engaged militarily uh, was in 1958. It took place in Jinmen, uh, which we say in English as Kinmen, spelled with a K. Um, but artillery bombardment officially ended in 1978, which is when the United States switched its diplomatic recognition from the Republic of China here in Taiwan to the People's Republic of China based in Beijing. Um, so as you can see, the United States also has a hand in security issues in the Taiwan Strait. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Now, what about China's saber rattling and displays of force? We've seen a lot of that. And how often is, is this happening? And yes. Well, I remember the first time uh, in my memory was in 1996 on the eve of the democratic elections, the first democratic elections here in Taiwan. Uh, and that was a, a missile launch in the Taiwan Strait. Um, and also Chinese jet flyovers have become a regularity since November of 2015. In fact, this year on January 24th, uh, China sent several military planes around Taiwan flying through the ADIZ, which is Taiwan's airspace. Now at the same time, interestingly enough, the United States also sent two warships through the Taiwan Strait. Yes. I don't think that's a coincidence. I don't think that's a coincidence <laughs> either. So, um, also, Taiwan has outlying islands, and they traditionally have been important military outposts, especially those close to China. Mm. So, how strong is the military presence there? That's a great question. Actually, let's just look at the example of Kinmen. And you can see on the map here, Kinmen is this sort of magenta color uh, that's right nestled up against China in its figurative backyard. Um, and it's very close to China and, and relatively far away from Taiwan. Um, so back during the Cold War era and frosty relations between China and Taiwan, uh, there were about 100,000 troops that were stationed on Kinmen. Uh, and today, there are only about 3,000 troops. Now, the Defense Ministry says that this streamlining of the military does not affect military power. Um, and that is because they're now focusing on defense, uh, effective deterrence. So the plan is no longer to take back mainland China. We've actually seen a lot of this demilitarization, not only in the outlying islands, but on the island of Taiwan itself. 
remember like 20, 30 years ago, uh, it was very difficult to, for an average person to go on a beach in Taiwan. Then following the end of martial law in 1987, they actually opened those beaches up slowly but surely. And today we finally see people surfing in That's Taiwan. That's true, we even host international surfing competitions in Taiwan. Right, which is something that would never have happened during the martial law era. Now recently we did an interesting report on one of the Kinmen Islands. Um, I want to point you to an island called Da Dan Dao. So Courageous Island or Bold Island, which is one of the teeny, it's a little tiny speck. I don't know if we anybody can see that. We wouldn't have noticed it if you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> you can't see it. Out to us. Right? You might have to look it up on the uh, internet. But Da Dan Dao uh, is part of Kinmen. It's only about four and a half kilometers from the Chinese coastline. But by comparison, it is 200, more than 200 kilometers away from Taiwan. It used to be exclusively military in purpose. But as of March 1st of this year, they've opened up Da Dan Dao to tourism. And we've done a report on this. Let's have a look. 50 years ago, these men were stationed on Da Dan Island. They may have grown older, but they still remember their moves like it was yesterday. These former soldiers are helping welcome tourists, a new phase in the island's history. There's a daily limit of 150 visitors, and you have to register in advance. Tours leave from Leyu, also known as Little Kinmen. Tickets cost 1,500 Taiwan dollars for about 50 U.S., and they're half price for residents of Kinmen. Kinmen County Chief Yang Zhengwu says the day trips will include experiences for retired soldiers who want to relive their memories. And many former soldiers who served on the island have returned as volunteers. For them, the island is full of memories of days gone by. This retired soldier says the top bunker used to be his sleeping quarters. He had to be prepared to fight in the place where he slept. One of the military slogans you'll see on Dadan is, it's a lonely island, but the people are not alone. With an influx of tourists, the lonely days are a thing of the past. All right, that was Dadan Dal, a fascinating new travel destination. Up next, we have a segment called Taiwan by Number. Every week on Taiwan by Number, we introduce a facet of Taiwan via a number. Now, this week's number is 220,000. And it has to do with how much it takes to raise a family, family expenses. And did you <laughs> guess? <laughs> I don't think you're good with uh, numbers. Huh? No. I'm terrible with numbers. This is, I'm going to regret, you know, <laughs> allowing this in the show. <laughs> um, 220,000. Well, we also have a problem because I don't have a family. That's true. In Taiwan. Okay. Well, do you want to look at what the video has to say? Let's watch the video. Let's first. watch the video. Taiwan has one of the lowest birth rates in the world. Why are couples reluctant to have babies? The high cost of living is a major factor. Mr. Wong says he and his wife need to make $80,000 a month to raise a child. Ms. Wu says her family needs an income of over 100000 to support their family of four. She spends 36000 a month to educate her two children. A job bank found that 85% of married couples says it takes $85,000 a month to support a family of three in Taipei. That's 25000 for rent, 20000 for food and for education, 10000 for insurance and for other expenses. Internet Job Bank Vice President Ho Chi Sun says this financial pressure is a major factor in the low birth rate. Local governments have been offering subsidies to try to get people to have children. Penghu, Taoyuan and Zhanghua offer $30,000 per child. Taipei, New Taipei and Lianzang County give 20000 Lianzang also gives 80000 for the third child. But it looks like those subsidies are not working. The birth rate last year was the lowest in eight years at just 1.06. It looks like couples need more incentives than a one-time monetary gift to have more children. Okay, Andrew, so 220,000, let's look at this graphic here. Okay. It's actually the amount it takes to educate a child in Taipei for a year. And we're uh, talking about a preschool child. Oh. So the average. Okay. So private kindergartens or private preschools. And that's a lot of money. That's number third expense after rent and food 300,000 for rent 240,000 for food right this is in a year in for Taipei a City family of 3 okay so and the education is for the child right okay so this is one of the reasons um that it's not really working when they're just giving a subsidy when 
the child is born of 20 or 30,000. Yeah, that doesn't go very it, it far, does it? It doesn't go very far. And, you know, we saw that Taiwan had the lowest birth rate in eight years last year, despite these subsidies. But this year, the government is planning to increase subsidies. They're going to have some monthly subsidies up to the age of four, beginning in August. So that will be from 2500 to 5000 depending on your income. Okay. So we'll see if that uh, helps, you know, the incentive to give birth. I mean, that's a big difference, like a one-time deal versus like a monthly, monthly sort of thing. Right. Will you still get the one you shot still get at the, the beginning? One okay, the time, big yeah, boost? When you have the baby, when you, okay. yeah, that's a big deal too, yeah. <laughs> having a baby. Yeah, huge expense. So Now, was kind of finances something you were thinking about when you decided to have kids? Not at all. If I did... I don't. I still would have kids, but I probably would be very overwhelmed. You would have thought a lot about I, it. I would be did. overwhelmed, and we're spending more than we ever imagined on our kids. So yeah, it's better not to think too much. Yeah, I mean, I thought I just thought about I would like to have a child. You know, mm -hmm. so. And so you found a way to make it happen. We find a way to make it happen. Well, hopefully these subsidies will, uh, I guess, encourage more people to have kids. So we can help we'll that see. birth rate that's right. falling a bit. So I think there's a lot of things that they need to consider, but um, incentives like these are, are definitely one thing that can help. And we'll see if that helps. All righty. Up next, we're going to turn our attention to a segment we're calling Hashtag Taiwan. And as you can guess by that name, we're going to be checking out what's trending on social media, on Facebook and Twitter. Let's have a look. Every week in Hashtag Taiwan, we bring you the hottest topics on social media in Taiwan. This week, it's China's cuddliest ambassadors, pandas. A member of China's National People's Congress, or NPC, suggested on March 8th that perhaps China could send a pair of pandas to Kaohsiung. China has been using pandas as goodwill ambassadors for centuries, ever since Empress Wu Zetian gave a pair to Japan in the Tang Dynasty. Taiwan already has three pandas at the Taipei Zoo. In 2008, China gave Tuan Tuan and Yuan Yuan to Taiwan after the KMT came to power. Later, they had a daughter, Yuan Zai. Kaohsiung Mayor Han Guri welcomes the idea of pandas coming to his city, saying they could be called make a lot of money and make a huge fortune. But he says it's up to the Kaohsiung City Council. One councillor, Huang Jie, says the city's Shoushan Zoo has neither the budget nor the manpower to care for the pandas. Zoo official Zhong Xunzi says they have room for them, but it would cost more than a million U.S. dollars to house them. That's the zoo's entire budget for one year. One person tweeted this picture, in which the panda says, I won't come unless you give me 2.3 million U.S. dollars. On Facebook, over 180,000 people voted in a Taiwan-based survey. 56% opposed the idea, while 44% welcomed the pandas. Over 20,000 commented. Many said the city zoo should focus on taking better care of its own animals, like the endangered Formosan black bear. This picture from at Get Green on Facebook was making the rounds in Taiwan, comparing Formosan black bears to pandas. It shows the pandas win in a number of categories, like total number and cost. When it comes to what they eat, for most of black bears aren't as pampered as pandas. They have to fend for themselves. That's it for this week's Hashtag Taiwan about panda politics. Be sure to follow us on social media and send us story ideas on Facebook or Twitter. Now turn to a problem that affects 70% of junior high school students in Taiwan, and that is myopia or nearsightedness. Let's take a look at this report. A sixth grader is playing games on a cell phone. His mother watches with concern. Back when he was in the fourth grade, he was mildly nearsighted, she says. They were using eye drops to control his vision loss. But now, she says it's no longer working, and his eyesight has grown progressively worse every semester. When it comes to vision loss, this boy is not alone. By 2018, about 45 percent of elementary school students in Taiwan had problems with their eyesight. For junior high school students, it was 70 percent. By comparison, 25% of teenagers in the United States are nearsighted. In Germany, the number is 15%. In Japan, 24% of elementary school students and 50% of junior high students are nearsighted. Those figures are significantly higher in Taiwan. 
Ophthalmologist Wang Mengqi says he's had a case of a fourth grader with retinal detachment, a severe problem that requires surgery. Wang says prolonged use of consumer electronics could quickly worsen a case of nearsightedness. People with severe nearsightedness are 10 to 40 times more likely to experience retinal detachment. Doctors say there are things you can do to protect your eyes. They recommend doing more outdoor activities and taking 10-minute breaks after every 30 minutes of intense eye use. Now, the reporter for that story is our colleague, RTI's Shirley Lin. Welcome, Shirley. Hi. Great to have you on the show, Shirley. Oh, thank you. Well, well tell us about this problem of myopia. How serious is it in Taiwan? How serious? Well, um, the thing is, uh, Global Views Monthly last year gave a report saying that Taiwan has three highest in the world. They are the highest frequency of nearsighted pro um, you know, problems, and then highest degree of nearsightedness, Ooh. and earliest on in age and getting yeah, myopia. Wow. Mm. That's a lot of highs. That's really bad. <laughs> That's really <laughs> bad. It's sad. So mm. what is causing, what are some of the factors that are causing this? Well, one is pretty obvious. It's prolonged screen time. Okay. Screen you know, time. What does that have to do with it? <laughs> yes, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> right, no. you know, on a mobile phone, <laughs> on computer screens. But there's one other thing that's kind of important, and it's kind of new to me. Not enough exposure to sunlight. And we're talking about like teachers oh. and parents don't think that PE classes are all that important, especially outdoor PE classes. Okay. Because nowadays, it's only been like two PE classes per week for elementary to high school kids here in Taiwan. And that's really way too little outdoor activities compared to Australia, Singapore, and Japan. And um, if it rains, they skip P classes totally. Oh. And uh, if it's it close to- It rains a lot too. I know, <laughs> especially around this time of year, right? And if it's close to exam time, they turn P classes into self-study periods. Oh no. Wow. So do you think that, I mean, it's a bigger problem here in Taiwan than in other places for a specific reason? I mean, what is it about Taiwan? Is it because, I mean, it's such a close quarters, like it's a very densely populated city, I, especially in Taipei? Right. Yeah. I think that's part of it. I mean, when you live in the city, it's harder to get out to a, a nice park or to the beach. I mean, you have to make a lot more effort mm. than if you lived in the suburbs like in America and, and your backyard is green, mm. right? Yeah, mm -hmm. so. yeah Taiwanese parents, you know, they don't really take the kids out that much. Um, uh, Taiwanese kids are mostly into study, study, and no play. And <laughs> even though, Poor you know, kids. Wait, yeah. I don't know if the kids are into that. It's not like their parents uh, well, are into I mean, that. Uh, okay. <laughs> but okay, and then there's also cram schools, right? Um, you know, it's school after school, and so um, it's like day till night, and it, it really is just all study and just extra work and extra homework and everything, and seldom going out to nature. Well, yeah, we're talking about, you know, like going, not going out to nature and seeing green, you know, that's good for your eyes. But actually, we have easy access, like, you know, some mountains within you know, maybe an hour's drive, you know. But still, parents are not into, you know, taking the kids out. <laughs> you know, they... They um, enroll the kids in like, you know, piano classes or learning, I don't know, music or even like, I don't know. <laughs> it's all abacus. indoors and with, it's with all like indoors. something very close to your eyes. Yeah, exactly. You're, you're making me anxious. We were talking about anxiety, anxiety earlier. Anxiety, that's what I meant. You know, I think it's driven by parents' anxiety over mm. the kid's future. Yep, you're and right. And it means studying grades, tests, getting into this college and this high mm. school and this... You know, that's, that's driving this unhealthiness of yeah. myopia in children. Yeah. I wonder, though, if there's also something like if somebody's done a study uh, here in Taiwan and in China to see if there's a difference between reading simplified characters and traditional characters. So in Taiwan, we have traditional characters, which are smaller, more, more strokes. strokes, you know, harder to see. I wonder if there's higher myopia in Taiwan than in China. Mm. Well, um, I suppose that's true. I don't have the figures for that, but mm -hmm. uh, we'll have to look into as that. Is, you know, yeah, <laughs> can do their thesis on it or something. Yes, if you're <laughs> watching, <laughs> yeah, it's a free idea for you. <laughs> so, right. what can people do to prevent myopia or nearsightedness? Well, doctors are recommending one to two hours of outdoor activities every day. Whoa. Okay. Oh, I per like day. to have that. Yeah. It's not so easy though. Yeah, it seems easy, but we always seem so busy, you know, there's just no time. Um, and to rest 10 minutes after 30 minutes of like intense use of screen time. Okay. Oh. Every 30 minutes you rest 10 minutes. I don't think none of us do minutes. that. <laughs> I know, none of us oh, do that. I mean, that. the doctor, I, I take my kids to the doctor and they say that, but we just can't do it. It's hard. 
I yeah. feel like we've also been staring at our screens for about 30 minutes now. And maybe well, we need to pay more attention to what the dog is. Yeah. I do have an app, you know, that actually shuts down, not shuts down, it kind of blacks out the screen mm. after every 50 minutes. Mm. But oh. you can ignore it by just... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm in the middle of a good TV show. <laughs> yeah. So, oh gosh, it's the bad things that we do. But of course, we need to have regular eye checkups. That's mm. the best thing to do. Mm. Okay, so we need a lifestyle change, basically. Yes, note totally. to self. Go outdoors. I know, and, look and... at me. I've been wearing glasses since first grade. Oh, yeah. no. Yeah. What about wow. your kids? They're all nearsighted. They uh, now wear contacts, yes. Uh, My kids are kids. nearsighted, too. Yeah. Two kids. Yes. <laughs> wow. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for bringing us that report on myopia or nearsightedness. A very, very important issue uh, for all of us, actually. Uh, and you've also brought us something that we can feast our eyes on. You've brought us today's parting shot. Let's have a look. Wow, wow look, look at, at that. that. I know, Beautiful. look at that. Right, it's Those called colors. Intense, uh, the photo. Intense. Yes, and it's uh, taken by Ace Wu, who's actually the first Asian to win a couple of um, really uh, outstanding awards. But let's talk about the photo first. I've never seen salmon with such green, bright green head and salmon. Right? Really? Yeah, salmon. They're um, Pacific color. sockeye salmon. Okay, wow. it's got a green head and a red body. And look at that water spray. It almost looks like a sheet of ice. Right. Oh, and look, the trees in the background are beautiful. Yeah. Yellow yeah. and green. That's so anyway, he's the first Asian to win in wide angle category of World Shootout, which actually is the biggest underwater photography competition wow. in Europe. And he also won the national award representing Taiwan at the 2019 Sony World Photography Awards. Wow. That's an yeah. accomplishment. It I must know. be hard to take shots like this, too. I mean, you have to Seriously. have the underwater oh, camera exactly. and everything. Well, it was taken in Adam River in Vancouver, Canada, mm -hmm. last year around October. So water is freezing. And I actually have a video about that. Okay, let's have a look. Okay, so he's lugging 25 kilos of equipment on his back. Wow. And he's like lying in this freezing water for six days in a row, wow. trying to catch just the right shot. You know, and he says that the current is so strong that he even was like, you know, pushed back and everything, and he got bruises from it too. Mm. Yeah. So it's amazing. But wow. um, he did it. He said wow. it's all just totally worth it. So much goes into these beautiful, he, intense shots. He chose a beautiful place though. Look at yes. those fish. Wow, yep. that's amazing. Well, thank you so much for bringing us that parting shot. That was incredible. No problem. Thank yeah. you, Shirley. And thank you for joining us on Taiwan Insider. We hope you enjoyed this inside look at Taiwan this week. And do leave comments below and subscribe to us. Also, follow us on Twitter and like us on Facebook. That's right. You can also visit us online at english.rti.org.tw. If you have any ideas uh, for topics or if there's anything you'd like to see us feature in our show, you can send us an email. Thanks so much for joining us for Taiwan Insider. I'm Andrew Ryan. I'm Natalie So. See you next week. Bye-bye.